Yeah, it's a thing or two because <laughs> DevOps is uh, definitely much larger. So um, thanks, uh, thanks, Robert. So my name is Shiva Ramachandran. So as uh, Robert was talking about, I had done DevOps at uh, ServiceNow at, at uh, American Express and uh, took a team from doing waterfall to agile to DevOps. So did that complete transition. And the biggest challenge, obviously, is the cultural change, right? So how do you take a team which is two different siloed teams and pu put them together, bring them together, and what the cultural challenges are. So, you know, right from the leadership to everybody in the team feels that pain, right? How do you bring these people together and make them work as a single team? So, uh, what uh, you know, there are three different sections that I'm going to talk about. So, one is about the enterprise DevOps piece of it, the challenges with scaling to the enterprise DevOps level, and how uh, at ServiceNow we do DevOps. So when you look at these companies, there's something which is interesting about these different companies. They are all from different in industries. Do you know what's common between these companies? All these companies want to become technology companies, which is quite interesting, right? Because they are all in different industries, but they want to become technology companies. So why is that they want to become technology companies? If you look at in 2017, end of 2017, these companies were the top five companies from a market cap perspective. And that means it, you know, all these companies are technology companies. They should be doing something right. What is it they are doing something different and right compared to all the other companies? So they know that their business models are changing. Everybody knows that one. They are able to bring products much faster, much quicker, and also have a great experience for the customers. Because when the use of ex uh, the customer experience is much better, that's what stays in the mind. That's what sticks to your mind, right? So when you have an Uber app, when you have an Amazon app, so it sticks in your mind. So that's what makes the big difference for them. So how do these m companies make these changes so fast? How do they make these things happen so quickly? So when you talk about transformations, basically, we, let's take about a, a typical IT organization, right? So we have this wall of confusion which happens between line of business and the development teams, right? So the uh, line of business says, this is what I want. Development team try to understand that and then build what it is. So there's a lot of confusion that happens. And that confusion was solved because of what the uh, agile development methodology came. So these two teams started to work together. Now, there's something more than this one, which is basically between the dev team and the operations team. So what this does is there's again this confusion because dev team does their own development, throws it over the wall to the ops team. And you are all part of this one. You have seen this one in some form or fashion within your own organization because you're all doing some sort of DevOps in your organization. And once the, you know how does this get solved? It is because of DevOps, right? Because you bring these teams together and then start to work together as a single team. And that makes a big difference. Thank you, AT&T. So how do you scale DevOps into a much larger picture, right? So when you want to grow, if it's a pilot team, so, so it's much easier to do DevOps. But when you want to scale it up to the enterprise level, there are so many challenges that comes in, right? So let's take a quick look at it. So the challenges comes in various forms. One is process standards, right? So if you don't have a standard process across your all the teams, then there is challenges with that. Tools, there's so many tools that are out there because you name that there are, you know, each specific area, each specific tool has got a purpose. And how do you manage all these tools? How do you make it standard? So that becomes another challenge. So here's a, you know, uh, probably a typical uh, example of an uh, organization enterprise where you have purchasing systems, finance, you know, HR, manufacturing, all these different systems. Assuming that each one has their own way of doing things, because I've been in organizations where each one is kind of a separate line of business or a function, and they build their own systems and they have their own processes, then what happens is there's no standards here. If you don't have standards, then you cannot measure them properly. There's no way that you can share the uh, best practices across the team. There's no way that you can share the resources across this team. That becomes a much bigger challenge because if you want to uh, scale in, uh, you know, DevOps to the enterprise level, you need to have process standards. So that's where lean comes into place because if you start uh, leaning out your processes, then you will start reducing the waste, 
removing all the uh, wait times, the manual approvals, those kinds of things that you have. So we will talk more about how ServiceNow does some of these kinds of areas using automation. So first thing is to lean out your process, make your process standards as much as possible. The second thing is when you look at tools, right? So these are only some of the tools that we have in this overall picture of DevOps, right? So there is more tools that are coming up you know, every day in each and every space. Now, how do you manage this one? This is a much bigger challenge because this is basically touching the lives of every developer, right? Because if you talk, uh, talk to a developer, I have done this in the past, I have my own set of tools. I like these tools and I'm more proficient with that one, so I like to use these tools. So you go and tell them, uh, you know, I'm going to take this tool from you. It's like taking a toy from a baby, right? So they're going to uh, kick and scream and, you know, not like that piece of it. So this is a much bigger challenge, but with these kinds of tools comes a, another set of challenges, which is basically saying, how do I keep these tools up to date? How do I patch these tools? How do I make sure that everybody is using the latest uh, and greatest versions of these tools? So these are some of the challenges that comes in. But if you start working towards this one, having a set of common tools across your organization, and as new tools come in, then you replace the old tools with this one, then that becomes much easier. It is easier said than done. I know that it is because I have been part of that one. And, but that's what makes it much easier in the long run because if you have a proliferation of tools, it becomes much difficult to manage and maintain these tools. So let's now look at um, how ServiceNow does the uh, you know, uh, DevOps side of things. So this is something which you have seen many times. I'm not going to explain this one. So it's a continuous chain of things that happens from a DevOps. It's, it's not just doing development and may finishing at operations. It's maintaining and all the uh, bugs and issues that comes in is fed back into the chain again. So it, uh, it's a continuous loop. So how do we do release planning? So we bring in our customers. We bring in our uh, you know, various teams, we bring in our users, we bring in our uh, stakeholders, and then we start forming our product backlog. So once the product backlog is defined, then what happens is it goes through the vetting process and gets prioritized. And once it is priori uh, prioritized, then it becomes a sprint plan. And then from the sprint planning, we go into two-week cycles of sprints. That's what we follow every, uh, every two weeks we do that. And then uh, you know, uh, after every 24 hours, we have our scrum teams that meet and talk and uh, look at the progress that they made. And hopefully, we have a shippable product at the end. Now, this is a typical cycle. Now, uh, for ServiceNow, we release two versions every year. So uh, you know, it's not easy to release a product you know, uh, very frequently because of the larger scale of uh, things that we have. But we are working towards making our um, product size much smaller so that we can release much quicker. Then when we get to the sprints, right, so the first thing that we do is we have our product backlogs, we have our patch schedules, we re regularly release our patches, and also we have escalations that comes from our customers because there are certain issues that the customers face, so there are escalations that happens. So all these things gets prioritized and put into a backlog for all the teams to work in. And when that uh, backlog is created, what we do is basically then we uh, assign the team works on it and then says which sprint and which team each, uh, you know, uh, they're going to work on. And once the sprints are defined and we have these things, then they work on it. And then we have the sprint completion taking into the next level, which is testing. Now, there are different, you know, as I talked about, there are different ways to do the same process, right? So yeah, ServiceNow has got two different ways to manage our sprint planning. So we have our SDLC task board where all our uh, sp uh, stories are uh, managed, or it can be managed out of a visual task board that we have on the product. So one cool thing that what ServiceNow does is everything that we do is done on our own product. You know, eat your own caviar or eat your own dog food, whichever way you want to call it. So we do that. So we have all our development all our metrics, all our reporting, everything is done on ServiceNow itself. There are certain tools that we use, we will talk about, like for example, we use Jenkins, we use Jasmine, and different tools for testing. But 
all our automations, all our reporting, all our metrics, all our dashboards is all done on service bo uh, service now, so it's much easier to maintain them. So this is one of our task board that we have. So it talks about uh, you know what are the stories and how it moves from various stages. So uh, this is uh, this is on service now, and also we have reporting on service now, which talks about each one of these stories. And it can be a problem, it can be a defect, it can be an enhancement request, and where the sta state of this one is. So this is something which helps us to understand where each story stands. And this is something that the leadership also is looking at it closely, saying what features, where is it, when is it going to be released, so they can have a quick view of it. So when we get into the code, so the challenge that we have with the different tools that we have across is, how do you get all these metrics into a single place? Because each tool does not talk to the other. So they are all standing in silos. Th so the biggest challenge is, how do you use the APIs to bring this information into a single dashboard? Right. So that's what ServiceNow does it very effectively. We have what is called as a performance analytics dashboard that brings all this information together. So here we talk about, this is a real-time uh, snapshot that we have that talks about all the various levels of you know, where the code is, wha wha how many defects are, and where we stand in this one. So once the build of the code is done, so we, have, we use Java primarily for all our code. And so once that build is done, then what we do is then it goes to Jenkins, and then we have continuous testing. So that is automatically kicked off. And every night we have these testing, automated testing that runs. And if the test runs are successful, if it's less than you know 0.25% uh, defects or issues, and uh, there are certain test cases it passes, then automatically we promote that code into the next instance, which is basically our customer demo instances that we call it. So where we are able to have our customer demo kind of data that we have run these automated test uh, tests into that one. So this is something which is very helpful for us because then we are able to see how many test cases have passed? What is the uh, you know what? Where do these uh, specific uh, stories stand from a testing perspective? Now, there are obviously there are various uh, types of uh, test results that we do, and if suppose there are tests that did not pass continuously for a few days, then we don't allow that team to promote any code into the next instance. They have to go and fix these things because you have to have some kind of policies around these things. Otherwise, what happens is people will be like, oh, yeah, I'll get to that uh, fix later. You know? So then it goes on, and then it'll be like just before release, they're like, oh, I totally forgot about it. Yeah, we were supposed to take care. And then, you know, then hell starts to break loose at that point of time. So that's what we try to avoid. So if a specific team has got a certain area where they have uh, not fixed the issues, then we don't allow them to move forward. So those kinds of things are something which helps us to maintain the quality of the product. So here's uh, another dashboard of uh, you know what is the progress of each one of the teams. So you can see that you know it talks about where each one of the uh, teams are, where they have progressed, what are the defects, how they are moving forward with that. So it allows us to give a view of what the backlogs are, what the issues are, what the fixed targets are, what's the regression uh, cycles that are going through this one. So it makes it much, much easier. <laughs> so this is another view of the entire dashboard that we have. So ServiceNow is a product that, uh, you know, as, uh, as you have told, many people are using it. And there are a lot of third-party tools that we use. There are thir third-party software that we use. So if you want to use a third-party software, we have to get approvals because we don't want to be liable at a later point of time after the release has happened. So what we do is we have to get approvals, not only from legal, from the leadership, so there's a whole approval cycle. So s we use ServiceNow for doing that approval process also. So it goes through the entire cycle, and people have to get the approval from the uh, uh, each one of them. And when you look at the approval cycle, so if somebody doesn't approve, say for example, you know, uh, legal team does not approve it, then there's automatic escalations that happens and makes it much easier because if you start developing it and then towards the end, the uh, legal team comes and says, no, you cannot use it, then your entire time you're wasted on that one, right? So we make it much easier for the developers because before you start using something, you get the approvals beforehand itself. 
Um, another interesting thing that ServiceNow does to maintain the quality because uh, for us, you know, we want to make sure the product that we release is something that the customers are using it and it's a good quality product. So how many of you are familiar with the Andon card that uh, Toyota uses? Okay, a few of you. So let me explain that. So in a Toyota manufacturing uh, facility, as the cars are getting manufactured, if suppose there's a defect that somebody finds out, then there's a rope that goes around the entire shop floor. So anybody can pull that wa uh, rope and the whole production line stops. You know why they stop that one? The reason is because if you let that car go, then there's going to be more such kind of defects that will come in, and then you will have a defective car which doesn't probably have one of the doors or doesn't have a brake uh, fitted properly. So they stop that entire production line because they want to fix that uh, issue right then and there. So similar to that, we have something called as a red line metric. So for example, a team has got a red line metric, say, of X lev uh, at a level X. That means they have certain number of defects that they are allowed to have. And if, they, if the uh, red line is much higher, then that team will not be allowed to do any additional new features or capabilities, cool things that they want to deploy for the next release. They have to first fix all these issues, bring this red line down before we move that. And this is one of the ways how we maintain the quality of the product. Because a lot of times what happens is you might have a long list of issues, but then you keep giving uh, new features and capabilities. This is still going to grow. Right, your technical debt will continue to grow and you'll not be in a position to bring it down. So that's what we try to avoid here with this red line metric. So this, is, this, is, this red line metric is something that is closely watched from the leadership, the development teams, the leads, the developers, everybody looks at it very, very closely because this is something which we need to look at it and we need to uh, carefully watch this one because if this red line metric doesn't go down, then everybody is like all hands on deck and making sure that this uh, definitely comes down. <laughs> so these are various views of the entire metric. So this goes by component by component. This goes by to the level of you know, uh, team by team, via you know, incident by incident. So that's how we look at it. Now, when you look at the operation side of things, so we have six support centers and three reliability uh, sites, uh, centers across the globe. So we have uh, something called as paired data centers where customers are having data in both, uh, you know, uh, for example, in US, you will have one in East Coast and one in West Coast. So that's how we keep our uh, availability up. It's like about 99.96% available that we have our systems, which is unheard of. That's because we have paired data centers where it's completely, you know, almost real time that is being synced up. And so we have these support centers and reliability centers where we have 24 by 7 monitoring and follow the sun uh, process where the engineers are working continuously to, making sure to make sure that all the data centers across the globe are uh, working properly. Now we have a lot of automation in our process. The reason why we have automation is the we want to make sure that things go much faster. Like for example, we have when we provide an instance to a customer, right? We want to make things go faster. So earlier it used to take a long time for a few days. Now it's in a matter of a few hours. So somebody signs a contract and says, I'm, I'm, I want to use ServiceNow. In a matter of a couple of hours, they'll have an instance ready for them, ready to go, full-fledged instance. That's because of the automation that we have. And we do our own internal scanning. We are using our own discovery product. And we have about more than 5 million CIs that we go and collect and manage at any point of time. So these are the CIs that we have, all our network routers, all our uh, instances, all our databases, everything is being managed from this perspective. And we have automation to deploy these in the rack automation. So we have a lot of automations built in the back end so that when, when somebody asks for it, so that's how we are able to quickly provision an instance and get it up and running. These are our, our own data centers that we own. Um, this is a uh, you know, type two data centers that is across the globe. Now, we also have incident management process within our own system that we use for managing our entire systems. And uh, so we have integration with Twilio, which is another product where we notify our uh, internal uh, engineers when there's an incident that comes up. So this is like, you know, we have tailored SMS uh, on call for to the on call engineer. So we'd make it much easier for our support people to uh, know when there's an incident and get on the system and, you know, quickly uh, resolve the incident. 
uh, we do a lot of change management. So we have a lot of instances. So we have more than 110,000 changes that we do in a month. And uh, we have more than 95% of the changes as standard changes. So that makes it much easier for us to get these changes approved and move forward. So less than only 1% 1 of our changes grows goes through the cab. That means they are the big, big major changes. That those are the only things that go through the cab. The rest of them are automated, so it gets easily approved from there. So this is a view of a cab workbench. And then we have our own event management where we monitor all the instances. And so the events are being fed to ServiceNow. And then we are managing all those in the events in ServiceNow itself so that it becomes much easier for us to know how the each one of the instances are performing. So I just want to, you know, there are a few more minutes, so I want to uh, make sure that I answer your questions. So we are. Uh, the question was: Are we uh, is service now uh, so a vendor, software vendor, or hosting company? What it is? So, so service now is a software as a service. So it is IT operation software that we build, and we branched into uh, service management, uh, HR, security ops. So we have done all the uh, branching to various areas. So we are software as a service. So that's why we host our own uh, data centers, our own data in that uh, data centers. How do you your, your ops? You some people automate. Yeah. Bill, because somebody does a purpose built script, yeah. and then they go off and do some. So we have. Uh, automation folks, so the support folks uh, uh, write automation scripts, and then we maintain those versions of it. So the ch there are two things that we do. One is version control, second is knowledge management. Right, so a lot of times people write code and then leave, and then we don't know what how to maintain this piece of it. So we maintain our own knowledge management. So we have our uh, code that is written and how these code has to be managed and maintained. So we have a complete version control of that code along with the knowledge management. That's how we maintain that, good question. Yes, correct. Yes, exactly. They are part of the de DevOps team. So they do the automation. Yeah. Yep. Everything. Everything. So, so the uh, you know, for example, our ops team is also managed from this persp uh, perspective, right? So, if ops team wants to say go into a totally new technology for doing it, they they have to show that their number of incidents is much lower, so they can move into the next uh, you know new technology they want to do. So we have two teams, right? So ops and support. So ops team is basically doing the operations for our internal purposes. The support team is working with our customers to manage that piece of it. Correct. So uh, we are out of time. Uh, so thank you very much. And also we have uh, our session from 3.30 to 4 this afternoon. So um, in one of the uh, suites up, up there. So if there's anything, then uh, we'll, uh, we'll be up there and then we can talk about it. Or we'll be here for some more time, so if there's any other questions, you can ask us also. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you.